A very good morning, everyone. It's really good to have you with us this morning, and a very warm welcome to Crescent Church. Uh, thanks for coming along today, especially if this is your first time. We want to make you particularly welcome. This morning, we're continuing our series looking at the book of First John, and Dan Lannan is going to be speaking to us on chapter 5, the first 12 verses of chapter 5, and his title is God's Testimony. But let's begin our time together by focusing our minds on the Lord as we read a psalm of praise, Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. He made known his way to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. It's great to have the CK Kids in with us this morning, guys. Thanks for, for being here. Um, and they're going to be here in the first part of our service, and then they're going to head out to our CK uh, Crescent Kids summer program during the second song. So if you're here and you're a primary school kid, you're very welcome to head out to that and join in with the fun. And with that in mind, we're going to sing our first song, and I believe you guys are going to help us out here. You're going to come up to the front and help, help show us the actions, am I right? You're going to sing really loudly and help us out with that. It's called All Through History. So let's come up to the front. And let's stand and, and sing together um, as we sing our first song all through history. Bro, we want you adults to try and participate in this as well. So maybe um, you guys stand up as well and try and perform the actions along with these guys. We're going to have some helpful volunteers as well.
away our sin So we could get to know our God again The Lord is good, the Lord is strong And we will live our lives for Him You guys were great. To be honest, I need a lot more practice with that one. I think a few of us do, but thank you for showing us that. And some great truths in that song as well. Um, and let's, let's turn to God and, and thank him for some of the things we were just singing about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truths that are contained in this simple song. Thank you that it is true that you have been faithful throughout history. And thank you that you are just the same when it comes to each and every one of us. Heavenly Father, it's true that you're not far away, you're not unpredictable. You're the God who has come near, so near, in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is totally consistent. And so, Lord, we can trust you no matter what difficult things we face in this life. We thank you, Father, that your Son, the Lord Jesus, did die to take away our sin, so that we can know you again, Lord so that we can know your kindness. May each of us come to know your love and your kindness for ourselves and then live lives for you and for you alone. We do pray, Father, for our world and we pray for those who are suffering as a result of war, poverty, and sickness. Lord, we realize we're incredibly blessed and and privileged and we ask that you might help us to use the many things you've given us to bless and help those in need. May our actions show everyone around us at work, at school, at university, that Jesus is indeed our King. We pray for our church family, Lord, particularly for those going through times of suffering, whether that be related to mental health or physical health, financial struggles or challenging family relationships. Please, would all those who are suffering be able to to bring their pain to you, Lord, and may they experience the comfort and peace that only you can bring. Lord, we ask that you might bless Dan as he ministers to us from your word this morning. Uh, As he speaks, may you give us a renewed sense that all scripture is God-breathed. May we not be resistant or disinterested as we listen, but please give us ears to hear and hearts that are ready to change in response to the truth of your word. And so, Lord, we ask that you hear our prayer, and we pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to worship God once more as we stand to sing Jesus, your name, after the introduction.
delighted to have Jonathan and Esther Campbell with us this morning. Um, we've been supporting the Campbells as a church for uh, many years now as uh, they've served the Lord across a variety of different countries. And they now serve in the Netherlands. And Rab Abraham, who's one of the elders here, is going to come and conduct a short interview with Jonathan and Esther to find out the latest uh, news about what's going on in their lives. So thanks, Rab. while he was a student in Belfast. And he decided to join the OM ship, the Logos, uh, where he gained knowledge in God's word and training in evangelism. And he was fortunate enough to meet Esther here. Um, and some years later, they married. He studied theology uh, in the Netherlands. And they were commended from Crescent to study Arabic in Jordan in 2003 and serve with OM in the Middle East. They were asked by OM uh, to lead uh, the university ministry in Beirut in 2006, and Jonathan led a team of 15 workers in student ministry from different organizations. They left in 2012 and moved a year later to South Africa, uh, where they served with OM in recruiting and training South Africans on the o at the OM training base until 2021. And in that year, their visas were denied several times and the door to South Africa was closed. And the Lord then led them back to the Netherlands in January 2022. They're serving there now with OM in recruiting and training Europeans for North Africa and the Middle East and are working among refugees and international students. So that is a really brief summary of um, a quite exciting uh, number of years in their lives. 
Um, so Esther, perhaps you can update us on the last few years and also on your family and your ministry. Thank you. I think my kids are happy they don't have to be on stage. <laughs> um, I'm going to look at the clock because I have a very short time, so please forgive me if I go a few minutes over. We have a large family. Um, when we were asked to leave South Africa, it was really um, very, very difficult for us as a family. You've got five kids, um, teenagers who have been in South Africa for eight years. They were really into the schools, into the culture. They, I wouldn't say they felt South African, but they felt very at home. Um, so when the Lord led us back to the Netherlands, my first priority as a mom was I want to make sure that our kids settle. And the Lord opened the doors in amazing ways that they could even continue to do their education in English. That for us was really also a priority so that they could go anywhere in the world to continue uh, further studies. So the middle four are at an international, sorry, the middle three are at an international school and they have a Cambridge system. So it's a Dutch school with 140 students that have a separate floor that follow uh, the Cambridge uh, system, whose parents are all living in our town, who are either at the university uh, as a lecturer or who work for an international company. And they really settled well. Rebecca is starting university um, next week. She's going to do industrial design engineering. And the others are still then uh, in the Cambridge system. And Joshua is at Dutch school. So even though it was a hard year adjusting, maybe more for Jonathan and myself, um, the kids really settled well. They go by bike everywhere to their friends, to school, and they love the freedom of being on their bikes. Um, when I came back to Holland, I had been gone for 22 years, and it was very difficult for me because people assumed, because I'm Dutch, that I would just adjust, and it was very, very hard. Um, we were going through a difficult time, and I really felt that everything was taken that I had known for all these years. I had to start a house, I had to get furniture, I had to just settle the kids, paperwork, everything. It was just such a roller coaster. And as I was listening to the song of Your Name Can Silence the Storm, that's really over the past year what I've experienced very much. Every day I felt, <laughs> what else is coming? It was just so hard. And I just really clung to the Lord, knowing that when everything else is taken, God was saying to me, am I enough? There's nothing else left that you feel, <laughs> but am I enough? And I really held on to that, and you know that his faithfulness was new every morning. Um, because of that pain that I was experienced, I could reach out to international ladies. Our town has quite a few of international ladies, and they were really struggling with the same things as I, adjusting to the culture, not finding purpose, being at home, uh, feeling lost, missing their uh, country that they came from. These were international expat ladies, but these were also refugees. And as I was ministering to these ladies, my heart really grew towards the refugees, because they didn't have like the expat community, maybe the finances or the, the work situation to fall back on. They were really left on their own. They didn't integrate very well. And as my desire grew to work with refugees, the Lord actually opened up an opportunity for me only last month to work at the refugee center. There's 550 new refugees that came to our town. 85% of them are Syrian. And I just started there as a volunteer, mostly with paperwork and logistics, but just to help them in the whole procedure up till they get their residency in the Netherlands. So this is something now I will continue in. I'm really passionate about that. Um, I can't share with them, but I can really pray for them every time. So we have like an open morning where they come and they have questions on their residency status or they were in a fight and they need legal issue, you know, to resolve legal issues or they need contact with a lawyer. So a team of three of us will help with that. And then there's another Christian organization that has asked me to help them set up a, what we call a house of joy. This will be a house where the refugees will come and where we can actually do activities with them. So we can teach them Dutch, we can do a program for children, for women. And this is in the very beginning stages because the refugees only just recently came to our town. So this is all being set up. So all the previous year of Seeing the refugees, seeing the international ladies has helped me now to be in a more structured um, volunteer role to help, help with that. Um, I'll hand over to Jonathan very shortly. We're also um, part of a small uh, international student church. 
the church is mostly run by students. They do the worship. They uh, do the order of service. Rebecca also is part of the worship team. And we had a meeting with the, the leaders of the church, and they would like us to involve more in the church in a, more of a leadership role to help um, small group leaders who are against students, just to mentor them to make sure also that what they're teaching <laughs> You know, it's, it's what, the, what the leaders agree with. Um, it's an older couple. They are retired. He's actually from a brethren background. And they just have a passion for students to serve them. So it's a small church. Um, Asian students, students from Indonesia, from um, some uh, South American countries. And they're all studying at the university in the town that we're at. So you can pray for these things that... The Lord will continue to help us to focus because we're kind of different directions that we're doing things. Um, for wisdom, for our family, we're still settling. Though the kids have settled, Jonathan and myself are still in the process of settling. It's, it's hard at times, um, but the Lord has really been faithful. So that's definitely over the last year and all the difficulties, uh, we just really more realize that when everything is taken, the Lord is, is there. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to Jonathan, otherwise the time is gone. <laughs> sorry, I went to... Uh... I do have to say something, sorry. <laughs> I'm speaking on the overseas link on the 9th, on a Saturday morning. So for whoever wants to hear more about the refugees or over this past year, see some photographs, please, you're very welcome. And at the back is our newsletter from May. And also a sign-up list if you would like to sign up uh, for a newsletter. Amen. <laughs> right. So um, when we moved there last year, um, OM, Operation Mobilization, uh, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what OM is. It's a mission agency. And we focus on church planting and reaching out into least reached areas of the world. You know, this, this year, 2023, world population was hitting the 8 billion mark and the estimate is still 3 billion people on the planet still have never heard the gospel, have no access to a church, do not know a Christian. So the work is not done, okay? The, the job of world evangelization is still very much uh, needed. And so I'm working with the, what we call the MENA team, Middle East, North Africa, and I am coordinating the mobilizing drive in Europe for Europeans to go into the North Africa MENA region. Uh, the OAM ship had just spent the last year. Tomorrow it will arrive in Mombasa. There's two ships now. A new ship was just uh, launched again this year. But the Logos uh, Hope will be in Mombasa tomorrow in Africa. So it's just finished its time in the Middle East. And I was taking care of the mobilizing and recruitment of Arabic speakers to go and serve on the ship. And that will continue uh, with recruitment of Arabic speakers to stay on the ship, even though it's now moving out of the Middle East. If you want to hear stories of how that went, I have got a ton of stories. <laughs> you can catch me later, and I'll share some of that. And you can pray for us. Another thing that I will be working on as we move in uh, further this year in the recruitment process is as we want to see people recruited and serving in these regions, what we also want them to understand is how do they go about making disciples. So as part of the recruitment process, I will be working with some to meet with students, spend time with them, to begin to practice what we would like them to do when they would reach to the mission field. So in other words, to say, would you like to go and serve in Lebanon? Would you like to be in Algeria or somewhere like this? You can start doing what we would want you to do right here, right now, in your context at the university, in the business, and so forth. Thank you. Not say much more. That's great, John. Amen. Um, thank you both. Um, uh, as Esther has said, there's copies of the prayer letters in the foyer. Please uh, take one of those. And if the Lord has put uh, what you've heard from them and their work on your hearts, perhaps you would consider uh, personally supporting them. Uh, as the Lord leads you. And please take time to chat with them afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rab and Jonathan and Esther. Great to hear um, how God is working in and through you guys. Uh, a few notices. Uh, this evening, John Kennedy is going to be preaching in our series, The Good Shepherd, based on chapter 10 of John's Gospel. 
Um, Dan Lanham mentioned last week that our mission of the month is, uh, in August is Bangladesh Theological Training. Um, it's an organization called SKT, and it's a ministry that exists to build church communities of believers from a Muslim background in Bangladesh by providing them with accessible theological training and resources. Sounds like a really wonderful work. Um, if you'd like to find out more about it, do come along to the prayer meeting on Thursday, uh, this Thursday, the 24th of August at 8 p.m., uh, where we're going to hear a little bit more about that work and have the chance to pray for it. Um, we'd encourage you to give as well. There's uh, boxes out the back this morning that we can give directly to this work. And if you're giving uh, online, do earmark your gift um, as being for Bangladesh theological training. On Sunday the 3rd of September, we're going to be having a baptism service here at Crescent. Uh, these are always joyful occasions, um, as those being baptized give an outward demonstration of what God is, has done in their hearts. Um, if you haven't yet been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus, we'd encourage you to talk to one of the elders here um, about how you might be able to be, be baptized, and the elders will be very keen to chat to you about that. Next Sunday morning, Johnny McGee is going to continue our series in 1 John. Uh, it's going to be preaching from chapter 5. And then in the evening, Dave Wilson is going to continue our series, The Good Shepherd, uh, based on uh, John chapter 10. Finally, our rally kids and youth programs are going to be restarting in September, which is uh, very exciting. We're looking forward to getting back up and running. Uh, do keep an eye out for the sign-up form, which should be appearing on Facebook and on the website in the coming week. And please be inviting young people to come along to join in with these uh, significant programs which the Lord has used so much over the years. Dan Lannan is going to come and minister to us shortly. Dan is married to Judith, and they have three sons, Nathan, Connor, and Joel. Dan and Judith have been a great blessing to me and to many of us here at Crescent, and they have a big heart for global mission. Um, before Dan comes to speak to us, uh, Catherine Dilworth has kindly agreed to read today's passage for us. Thank you, Catherine. We're reading from 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony of God that he has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for reading, um, especially because I kind of ambushed her yesterday, so that was very kind. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of our series in 1 John. Uh, we actually only have one more week to go after this one. Um, and if you've been here for the last number of weeks, you'll already be noticing that John keeps, up, keeps bringing up the same words and ideas, things like love, life, obedience, the family of God, and Jesus' incarnation. These themes keep coming up again and again as John connects them in different ways and talks about them in different ways. A lot of this seems circular. You know, one idea leads to the next, leads to the next, 
and can, it can feel a bit jumbled, it can feel a bit tangled. And for those of us who like a good, solid, linear argument to follow, John can get a bit frustrating. Now in chapter five, it happens again. But before we tie ourselves in knots trying to connect all the little pieces, or before we tune out because here's yet another sermon where John talks about love and John talks about life, we need to step back a wee bit and think about what John is doing. And I've left the clicker for the PowerPoint down here. So, brief walk. And it works. Um, so, major disclaimer before this metaphor. Um, if you know me at all, uh, you know I'm about as cultured as a goat. Um, and I'm happy enough with that. Um, I can't manage to clap to a beat, never mind appreciate good music. Um, our four-year-old Nathan has already worked this out. Um, and after hearing me sing, he'll sometimes feel he needs to encourage me about things I'm good about. He'll start saying things daddy's good at. Um, but <laughs> someone I, I work with, um, she's about to leave work and go and take up a scholarship to do a master's in art in London. Um, she is very cultured. Her boyfriend also works in the same department. And one day I came in and she was looking at a picture on, on the screen and it looked like she was looking at a picture of the top of his head. Um, so I joked, you know, it's a bit mean to keep track of his balding like that. Um, and she looked up confused and a little insulted. What she was looking at was a print of a painting that she had just sold for 5,000 pounds. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, it looked like a bald spot, but someone paid 5,000 pounds. All that to say, I don't know anything about art, and this is all from Google. So in the last 30 years of his life, Monet, who was a famous painter, basically stopped painting all the things he painted and instead focused on the water lilies in his pond. He painted these same lilies, this same pond, 250 times in 30 years. Different times of the day, different light, different perspectives, but the same subject, the same lilies, the same pond, and they're all very famous. And I think that's a bit like what John is doing. He's not building a linear argument, and he's not just repeating himself. These wonderful truths, the love of God, the life he calls us to, the obedience he asks of us, these truths have so gripped John they have so captivated his imagination that he keeps coming back to them. He keeps painting the same scenes from different angles in different lights. And maybe that's part of what he's trying to do for us. He's not only trying to convince us of something, to teach us something. He's trying to make us feel. He's trying to inspire us. He's trying to provoke in us a sense of beauty of these things that have so captivated him. He's not only trying to captivate our minds, but our hearts, our wills, our sense of wonder and beauty. And as we come near to the end of this series, it's important we're attentive to that. And for those of you who are here for the first service, isn't that what we did? We were captivated in our hearts. We were captivated by beauty. Um, and that's what John is doing. So as we approach the passage, if you quickly scan the text You'll see it splits largely into two sections. In verses one to five, John paints this dynamic and beautiful picture of the Christian life. He returns to themes of belief, love, and obedience. He asks, what does life look like when someone believes that Jesus is the Son? What does faith do in a life? Then in verses six to 12, he shifts to using courtroom language. He takes us to a scene in which God presents three witnesses that testify in defense of the claim that Jesus is his son. So John was writing his letter to people who already believed, people who had already come to know Jesus. But for people who don't yet know Jesus, it maybe makes more sense to take these questions the other way around. First, why should we believe? And then, what does belief do in a life? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with 6 to 12 and then come back to 1 to 5. So we're starting in the courtroom. Let's read 6 to 12 briefly again. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. 
And it is the Spirit that testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, that, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony that God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So this is the courtroom scene. The trial revolves around the claim that Jesus is the Son of God. We see that in verses 1 and verses 5 and throughout this section. On one side, you have the false teachers. You'll remember them from the other weeks in this series. These are the men who have been troubling the church John wrote to. Remember, in chapter 2, they denied that Jesus is the Son of God. In chapter 4, they denied that he had come in the flesh. And look at verses 9 to 10. On the other side of the courtroom is God the Father. And in verse 7, he calls three witnesses to testify the spirit, the water, and the blood. So that's the scene. But who are these witnesses? The spirit is the easiest of the three to decipher. John is saying that the Holy Spirit testifies to the sonship of Jesus. During Jesus' earthly life, the power of the spirit showed him to be the son. And today, the continued witness of the spirit draws people to Jesus and convinces them of that truth. We'll come back to this. But what about the water and the blood? Whatever John's referring to, his audience obviously knew what he was saying. He doesn't stop, he doesn't explain it to us, so it's not as obvious to us. And Bible interpreters throughout history have, have had a couple different ideas, and I'm not gonna go into them all, because most of them come back to make the same point. And the most commonly held view and the one I think makes the most sense is that both of these witnesses speak about the life of Jesus on earth. The water refers primarily to Jesus' baptism and the blood to his death. Taken together, they refer to Jesus' entirely earthly ministry, to his life. So God calls up his first witness to take the stand, the water. We read in the Gospels that at the beginning of his public ministry, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. The Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This began his public ministry, and after this he went out in the power of the Spirit. He miraculously showed he had authority over nature, authority over sickness, authority over the forces of evil, even over death itself. And his teachings showed he knew the very mind of God. He revealed the personality, the nature of God to mankind. So the water speaks to the affirmation and approval from God which Jesus received at his baptism. And then the continued authority and power in which he walked from that point on. It testifies clearly that Jesus was the representative, the Christ, the beloved Son of God. God then calls his next witness to testify, Jesus' blood, his sacrificial death. This also testifies that he is God's Son. And at this point, this is when John's opponents, this is when the prosecution stands up to object. Look at verse 6. John says, Jesus did not come by water only, but by water and blood. John's opponents wouldn't have minded if it was only water. They wouldn't have minded if there was only the witness of the water to speak about Jesus. They didn't object to that. They objected that he came by water and by blood. But why? If you're a parent, you'll likely relate to that feeling, and I'm not talking about me here, but you're in a public setting with your family, and it seems like everyone else's kids are wonderful, they're engaging in engaging conversation with adults. They're helping younger kids. They're washing dishes while reciting Bible memory verses. 
And then there's your toddler, the rough one, the whiny one, the stubborn one, the tantruming one, whatever. This is not me I'm talking about, it's you guys. Um, <laughs> and even if you know it's not really the case, and even if you know that toddlers are toddlers, and a lot of the time there's not much you can do about that, it's hard not to feel like your kid's behavior reflects on you as a parent, reflects on you as a human being. Whether it's fair or not, we often feel like a child reflects something of their parents. Or even more of us can probably relate to the very stressful situation where you've just sent a message or a text or a letter to someone you like. Maybe you're asking them on a first date or telling, you, telling them that you like them or whatever. Um, I've seen a wonderful video not too long ago. Um, someone I, who will remain nameless, and they've given me permission to say this. Well, this nameless person recently married my sister, Colleen. Um, <laughs> and there's a great video of this nameless guy literally rolling about on the floor moments after sending an initial message to Colleen. He's in agony waiting for her to reply. And to be fair, I don't think most of us in that situation are any different. We're, we're the same. Unless you're much cooler and more confident than most of us. And even if you're only sending a two-line text message, you pour over it. You write it. You rewrite it. And most likely, the moment you send it, you regret it. And did you come across too interested, not interested enough, too cold, too formal, too casual? Why do we care so much? It's because the message you, ref you send reflects on you. It represents you. They make judgments about you because of your message. A message communicates about its sender. John is claiming, and Jesus himself claimed, that Jesus is both the beloved son and the word, the ultimate communication from God. He's both the son and the message from God. In the Old Testament, the idea of being the Son of God meant being his beloved representative. Israel was called the Son of God, David gets called the Son of God, but Jesus took this idea even further. He said, I don't just represent God, but somehow he claimed that he shared in God's very nature. He claimed that he was one with God, that the Son was in the Father and the Father in him. The Son is God. So you see, in John's courtroom, if Jesus is found to be the Son of God, then he is the ultimate communication about God. He is God's greatest message to humanity. The Son of God reflects the personality, the nature, the very heart of God the Father. Everything Jesus did and said, and how he did and said those things, tell us what God is like. So the false teachers didn't mind the water's testimony. They didn't mind a son of God who shows the Father to be powerful and wise and just and good, but they couldn't stand the testimony of the blood. As we've seen in our previous weeks, they denied the incarnation. They denied the fact that, was, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. They denied that God became mortal, and there's nothing more mortal than to die. The testimony of Jesus' blood is that God became weak. God suffered. He gave up control. He was dragged along. He was mocked. He was rejected. He was humiliated. His body was torn and broken. The testimony of Jesus' blood is that God himself died. These false teachers, they want a spiritual God. They want a powerful God, yes, a wise God, yes, but one that is somewhat distant and remote removed from the physicality, removed from daily life. John has shown us, and ultimately Jesus' blood most profoundly shows us, that God is love. God is involved. Remember last week? God is close to us. He became one of us so as to be close to us and bring us close to him through his death. Jesus' blood testifies that God shoulders the responsibility for the creation he loves. Because he loves us, because he knew we could never break the chains of sin and darkness that hold us away from him, he did not want us to suffer, so he suffered. John has already said this in chapter 4, verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. 
He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The false teachers just didn't understand God the Father. The blood of Jesus speaks out loudly in the courtroom and testifies that yes, he is the son of God. He perfectly reflects the character of God the Father because God the Father is the source of real love. Of course, his ultimate word, his message, his son, would shoulder the task of costly, courageous, sacrificial love. For these are the three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and they are in agreement. Together, these three witnesses testify that Jesus is God's son. Then the trial comes to a close with 11 to 12, with the testimony of God. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Maybe you're unsure about the claims that Jesus made, the claims that the Bible makes or that Christians make about Jesus. Maybe you're here because you want to investigate those claims. Or maybe you think you've already investigated and already rejected those claims. But if these three are the witnesses that God chooses, then to investigate Jesus or to reject Jesus, we first have to listen to them. So first, read the life of Jesus in the Gospels. And as you do, realize that this man, Jesus, claims to reflect the very heart and personality of God. In his teachings and actions, we see what God is like. And then two, Consider the death of Jesus, what it means for there to be a God who shoulders the responsibility for the failures and sin and suffering of this world because he loves it, who, draws to, who drew to himself all sin, all darkness, and then dies and rises again, and in doing so breaks the power of sin, death, and evil. And then third, Jesus is still alive and active through his Holy Spirit. So ask God the Father to reveal the truth of Jesus to you through the Spirit. And if you've heard the witness of these three things, of the water, the blood, and the Spirit, then you've truly investigated Christianity. And then, and only then, in a way, have you the right to reject it, if you still can. And briefly, for those of us who are Christians, who follow Jesus, do we testify like this? Do we speak like this, like these three? Do we point to them? If we have an opportunity to share our faith, if we are asked about Christ, do we focus on the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the reality of the continued presence and power of God in the Holy Spirit, which leads people to Jesus? Or do we reduce all that Jesus is, all that he has done, to a brief, brief equation, to maths? Allowing these three witnesses to speak the water, the blood, and the spirit, it takes longer. It's not as neat, it's not as easy. But John says that's what God chooses to testify about his son. So now back to the start of the chapter, verses one to five. So John continues some of his argument from last week about love, but see how he does it. John uses verses one and five to frame this section with the same idea believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This section is about what happens to a life when someone believes that Jesus is the Son. What happens to us when, that, when we believe that? He is painting a picture of the Christian life with these same themes, these same scenes that he's focused on throughout his book. Imagine if you stop someone in the street outside and you said to them, here's a pen, draw a diagram of what Christians believe their lives to look like. If for some crazy reason they don't just walk away, maybe they would draw something a bit like this. Basically, someone's life starts at that side, they're living, they go on living, and then they meet Jesus. They come to a point, they believe Jesus, they're saved. Then they go on living their life, and eventually that line is broken again by death. 
after death because they believed a Christian enters heaven or eternal life. Obviously, this is an oversimplification and a caricature, but at least in society at large, that's roughly what people would say a Christian thinks their life is. But what does John paint? What does John say the Christian life is? So let's look again at verses one to five. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Central to John's vision of a believer's life is love. When we believe in Jesus, we are born of God. We are born into God's family of mutual love. In this family, we are loved by God. We love him. We love his children, and they love us. Everything else flows out of the Father's love. All obedience, all desire and power to overcome, they're rooted in the love that the Father has for us. Then from the second half of verse 3, you have this group of ideas all connected to overcoming the world. Let's unpack that a bit. Remember, this idea of the world has come up a few times already in John's letter. He doesn't mean the earth or the globe. They're not evil or bad. Because you remember a key argument for John is precisely that Jesus came physically with a real body in the physical world. The physical world is not the enemy. That's not what he's talking about. We saw some of what he means in chapter two. This is verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. When John speaks of the world, he means the world of humanity trapped in sin, under control of the evil one. Like he writes in chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world is under control of the evil one. The world is a thing that has desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So what does that actually look like if we could overcome that? So say I'm a Christian living my life, but I can't help but keep loving the world. I have its desires in me. My flesh, my body wants things, and I have, pa and I have little power to do anything about it. Tiredness automatically makes me angry. Hunger automatically makes me greedy. Sexual attraction automatically makes me lust. Then the desire of the eyes. I want what others have, I want more, I want better. I'm bored, I'm never satisfied. I live my life in pursuit of gaining things and experiences, whatever my eyes desire. And then the pride of life. I always have to look the best, be the best, be the funniest, the center of attention, the most spiritual, the most Christian. These things, the desires of the world, can completely dominate a person's life. But imagine breaking free. Imagine a life where you could just say no, where you could overcome all of that. Ultimately, overcoming the world is overcoming all that ties us to the darkness and keeps us under control of evil. But how? That sounds great, but how? Back to John's painting. Look at verse four. God's commands are not burdensome, for everything born of God overcomes the world. Some translations say everyone born of God, but more literally, the original text says everything. And that makes sense in the sentence because he's talking about commands. The commands are not burdensome because they overcome the world. The Father who loves us and created us as, has in his love given us commands. He's shown us how to live. And although that might sound like a burden, it is freedom because it is through this obedience that we overcome the world. But look at what else John says in verse five. The one who believes 
will overcome. This time he is talking about people. God doesn't ask anything of us he doesn't empower us to do. Just like the love we have for all Christians is a certainty and will flow out of the Father's love for us, so the fact that we will overcome is a certainty and will flow out of the fact that we are born of God. It's inevitable. It will happen. We'll come back to this at the end. So John has painted the picture of a believer's life. What happens when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? But when we compare it to our life that we could draw on the street, there's some interesting things. There's something that we haven't unpacked yet. He, John hasn't mentioned heaven. He hasn't mentioned eternal life. But it is there. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Eternal life is in the Son. Whenever we believe in the Son and enter the family of God, we have the Son. He is our brother, our Christ, our King. We have him. Therefore, we have eternal life. John will take this idea further in verse 20 when he says Jesus is eternal life. And this completes John's painting in these verses. So when we look at these two visions of a Christian life, it's striking to compare when things happen. If you look at the lines, the two events there, one is past and one is future. We were saved in the past and we will go to heaven in the future. There's not much going on in the present. It's largely irrelevant. The past ensures the future and that's it. But look at the life that John has painted in verses one to five. There's a lot of present tense. A Christian believes, obeys, loves, overcomes today. All present tense, all now. And the most striking present tense is the has from verse 12. Whoever has the Son of God has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. We have the Son now. We have life now. Eternal life is not only a future thing that starts after death. For John, eternal life is a present reality that we can begin to experience now if we have Jesus. You'll remember Danny Crooks mentioned this way back in our first sermon of the series. For John, eternal life is not just a future experience, but it's a whole category of life, a type of life, a life that can begin now. When I got engaged to Judith, our life looked really different than it looks now after we've been married for eight years. Back then, we didn't need to share our decision-making, our money, we didn't share a house, we didn't have kids, we didn't know each other like we do now. But in lots of ways, it was the same kind of life. We enjoyed being together and doing life together. We still laughed at the same things, we still got annoyed at the same things, we still had the same kind of hopes that we have now. Though engaged life was not the same thing as married life, one flows into the other. It was a continuation of the same kind of life, but just at its next stage. And I think that's a little bit like what John envisions when he talks about eternal life in the present tense. He knows that our future eternal life with Jesus, when we see him face to face, will be far greater than any Christian life now, but it will also be familiar. The same Jesus that we have and love now, we will have and love then. The same family of love, the same vitality and strength and courageous joy that allows us to overcome the world will mark our lives then. Eternal life after death is a natural continuation of the eternal kind of life now. One flows into the other like engagement flows into marriage. There's, of course, massive and beautiful change at that point, but there is comforting and solid familiarity as well. But look at the first image of the Christian life. You don't need a present tense at all. Remember in the courtroom, the false teachers didn't want the blood's testimony. But inside Christian culture, sometimes we don't want the water. 
and we don't want the Spirit. We're happy to have Jesus die for us, but we don't want his life before that, and we don't want his life after that. We don't want his teachings, we don't want his actions and what they mean for our lives now. And we don't want the Spirit, the continued presence of God in the world in the present tense. We prefer our faith to all be past or future, nothing affecting the present. One author has an evocative line about this tendency, and he doesn't mean to be disrespe disrespe disrespectful, but he calls people with this attitude vampire Christians. They only want a little blood for their sins and nothing more to do with Jesus until heaven. That is a shocking way to put it, but maybe usefully shocking. Verse seven, these three testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. We can't pick and choose between them. The first diagram is like getting engaged and saying, thank you very much for the ring. Can't wait to live in that amazing house you're building. See you at the wedding. And then walking away with a ring and a promise and wanting nothing more to do with your fiance to the wedding day. But the goal of the Christian life is not heaven, it is Jesus. Christian, don't settle for that first life. Yes, there's truth in that line, and maybe it's fine to start there, we all do, but don't stay there. Don't be content there. John is so captivated by the love of God, by the life he holds out to us in his son, that he can't help but keep coming back to these scenes. Throughout his letter, he paints them again and again, not only to teach us things, but to cause us to feel. Look at what he's painted for us in, in verses one to five. I don't often live in this life, but John makes me want to. And I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to motivate us by the sheer beauty of it. This is a Christian life that is dynamic and energetic, appeals to the heart as well as to the mind. A life in which the love of God is enacted through his son. It causes us to be born into his family of love. Family in which we experience his love and love him in return, as well as his children. We obey his commands because we love him, and his commands are not burdensome, but through them we overcome the world. All that ties us to the darkness, we overcome it through his son. All of this life is through the son. We have life because we have the son. He is eternal life. And of course, none of that is perfect now. We won't perfectly love we won't completely overcome. It won't be perfect until the day when our engagement flows into marriage and eternal life continues in resurrection. This is the life God, John is calling us to and that the Father is calling us to. So when we slip into living the first life, we need to let the beauty of the life that John has painted wake us up and call us back to live in it. And again, isn't that what happened to us in the breaking of bread? So John has made us want the life he has painted. But how do we get there? How do we get practical? It can seem to be really hard to get practical with passages like this, where one thing just seems to automatically flow to the next. It all just happens when we believe. But let's be honest, how's that going for us? How is this natural and inevitable process going? Do we see that flow in our lives? I think part of our problem, part of my problem, is that we don't realize that believing is practical. That is application. Belief in, in the first line is past tense. It's just mental agreement with a fact. That's all it is, mentally agreeing with a fact in the, in the past. But that's not what John talks about. That's not what the Bible talks about when it says belief. To live a life that flows from belief that Jesus is the Son, we first have to believe it. That seems obvious, but it's important, and not only for people who have never believed before. Remember that the believe in verses one and in five, they're present tense, they're today. Yes, we believed in the past and we were saved in the past, but this life we believe today. To live this eternal kind of life today, we believe that Jesus is the Son today. 
And of course, our hearts will drift. Our focus will drift. We will fall. We will sin. We will stray back into living in that first picture of life. So we need to come back again and again to the witnesses of 6 through 11, to the water, the blood, and the Spirit, and let them convince us again. Let them testify to our hearts again that Jesus' death, His life, and His continued presence through the Spirit, we need to let them convince us again to believe. And that belief is not just with our minds. We've already touched on this. Let the wonder of the love of God grip you. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. How sad would it be for us to get through an entire sermon series on 1 John and not be inspired to love God in response to His great love for us? We need to let the beauty of the life that John paints, the wonder of the love of God, grip our hearts. It's simply not possible to live the Christian life only with your mind. Of course, we need it, but we need emotion. We need thought to produce feelings. Yes, love is an action and love is obedience, but love is also in the heart. Have we grown cold? Can we read 1 John from start to finish without feeling anything? If so, we need to pray for the Lord to send the Spirit to direct our hearts back to Jesus, back to the love of the Father. Meditate on 1 John. Meditate on the three witnesses of 6 to 11 or the abundant life of 1 to 5 and let it stoke the smoldering embers of your affection back to life. These things are not optional for a Christian. They're foundational. Our hearts, as well as our minds, need to believe, and they will need reminded again and again. And finally, to live this kind of life, we need to actually do it. A theologian has a helpful line that defines true belief over mere intellectual agreement. To believe something is to act as if it were true. To believe something is to act as if it were so. In other words, believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that eternal life is in Him, that we are part of the family of God and that we can overcome the world through the fact that we are God's, believing these things is not about trying harder to feel more certain inwardly about them. To believe something is to act as if it's so. What would look different about your life if this was all true? If the testimony of the three witnesses were true? If it was true that we can, through the grace of God, live like verses one to five? Start small, start specific. What would be the difference to the rest of your day today, to this evening? What if it were true that eternal life stretched from today? and that we can experience it by knowing and having Jesus. How would I spend my time this evening? What if it were true that the other Christians in this room are my family because God is our Father and the way I love you is showing how I love them? How will that affect how we talk to each other after the service? What if it was true that we can overcome the desires of the world we can overcome everything that causes us to fall into sin again and again. Not perfectly. What if we could overcome that because we have been born of God? What habits would we seek to break if that was really true? Faith that means something is acted upon. When we read passages like 1 to 5, they can seem troubling. It can seem that all we do is believe and everything will flow from that. And then when we do believe and we don't see fruit, it can, it can worry us. And sometimes maybe that's because our belief is stuck in past tense, or maybe it's stuck in our minds without touching our hearts. If we want something practical, belief, faith is practical. It's something we do today, something we have in our minds, in our hearts, in our will, in our bones, something we enact, something we live. So I challenge you, when you're alone at some point over the next couple of days, read chapter 5, verses 1 to 12 again, believe it, and then think of small practical ways you can start living like it's actually true, like it's real. 
and we'll find ourselves living in John's painting of that life. So to finish. In 6 to 12, John took us to a courtroom, and in 1 to 5, he painted for us a beautiful life. Why should we believe in Jesus? We heard the testimonies of the water, the blood, and the spirit, who together declare him to be the Son, and God testifies that life is in him. Then what happens when we believe? We are born of God, we are brought into his family of mutual love, and we are given commands and the power to obey those commands, and they will, they will help us overcome the world, the darkness that holds us back from God. This life is available now. Eternal life is available now through Jesus. To have the Son is to have life. John wants us to keep coming back to believing in Jesus. He wants us to see the beauty of the life Jesus holds out so that that beauty will captivate us and inspire us to act as if it's really true. I'm going to pray to finish our service. I'm sorry for going over a wee bit, um, but there's tea and coffee out here, um, but I'll pray as we finish. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that you testify, you show that he is your son and that there's life in him. Convince us, Lord. Convince us through the life, the death, and the continued presence of Jesus through the Spirit. Convince us that he is the Son of God and that life is in him. Inspire us with the beauty of a life we can have with you, an eternal kind of life we can enjoy now with you. Change our hearts, Father. Thank you for this. Thank you for the wonderful salvation, the wonderful life you hold out to us. Captivate our hearts, Lord. Change our lives. Make us look more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, thank you very much, Dan, uh, for all that you said there. Um, yes, as Dan mentioned, there's tea and coffee out the back, um, and do go and collect your children as well if they're in CK. Um, and please join us again this evening uh, as well. But thank you for coming along.